my name is Erka Koivunen and uh, obviously I come from Finland. Some of you obviously are capable of speaking Finnish, but let's not, let's not. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not able to cope with my mum in Svenska, so yeah, that's English now. So uh, on your way into, the, into this room, you saw our motivational picture, the, the flyer that says that there are two types of companies, those that have been breached and those that have been breached but don't know about it yet. And uh, working with incident response for nearly 20 years, I, I can actually, I can confirm that. I was in the business of notifying the victims of those breaches for ten, the 10 years that I was working with the government. And it was always such a big surprise to the victims. Typically it was a mom and a pop uh, type of a small enterprise or company or a private citizen. And they had hard time understanding because they were running antivirus. How could they ever be hacked? Some more nerdy types were running Linux. That's impenetrable, they thought. And lately, Mac users have been really surprised to find that their, their systems can be compromised. I have been dealing with information leaks where a company or a database has, has been compromised and all the contents have been spread out. And I've been trying to figure out where that information came from, so whose systems it was originally that got breached. It's quite obvious to see who is the, the person who, whose personal inf information is contained in the database, but the source of that database, the controller of the database is not always evident. So I will walk you through with some aspects of what I feel about uh, the, the, the regulation is going to change in our uh, security posture and how I can uh, honestly argue that the mandatory reporting requirement that is inherent in the regulation is such a good thing and you, would, you should take a positive approach to that. All right, let's start with one ad piece of advice, this privacy by design and privacy by default and uh, the ideas of data minimization actually are there to protect you. If you are storing customer information, this uh, uh, design principle actually helps you in the, in the event of an eventual breach. When your systems get hacked into, and somebody is able to steal information there. You want to make it as difficult as possible to, uh, for the attacker to steal everything at once. You want to make it as difficult as possible for the already leaked information to be traced back to your customers. And if you're in a position to actually not store information that you don't need, please take that possibility. The US Federal Trade Commission has a pretty active chairwoman called Edith Ramirez and uh, sh lately she has become uh, a kind of a hero, hero to me. I've been lobbying against uh, the British uh, investigatory powers bill, some of the more draconian uh, 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 proposals that the UK government is having on uh, typically the signals intelligence agencies. And there's the, the, the line of thought in their legislation that they want to collect all the information, they want to make encryption as weak as possible so that they can break it and they don't want you to hold any secrets. And Nation state organizations and criminals absolutely love it when you are storing and collecting lots of information about your customers because that saves them the trouble of collecting that data themselves. 
they can simply hack into your systems and take the readily made databases, profiles of the customers and start using that as their own commodity. So if you by default limit the amount of information that you collect from the customers, you lessen the likelihood of you becoming a target of a breach. You are not that interesting a target to uh, the criminals. And if you happen to be a target and you get breached, the consequences of that breach are not that widespread. All right. Uh, some examples from our company. Traditionally, F-Secure has been an antivirus company. We make software that you install on your endpoints and servers and uh, uh, network devices that try to identify malicious binaries, malicious activity. That software doesn't work on its own. You have to realize that antivirus is a service. So our labs and our analysts are continually detecting new threats and pushing that knowledge to you for your benefit through that software. That software actually has to know pretty much anything that and everything that you are doing on the computer. So basically we are in a position to see better than yourself what's taking place in your computer, in your RAM, in your disk, in your network. And yet at the same time we actively refuse to collect that information. When, for instance, if you explicitly give a permission to report back to us when a malware has been detected, we actively refuse to know who you are. We actively refuse to know what is your exact IP address. We strip away quite many bits from the IP address so that we can only determine which operator or which country that notification comes from. We don't want to know. Which is a design feature that we have kind of a, taken a moral stand of it, on it, but it's also a practical safeguard against us being breached and you being breached as a consequence. And um, it kind of, kind of a, makes us a bit old-fashioned company. You pay our services by paying money, not with your personal information, if you, if you know what I mean. Quite many business models currently are blatantly against this principle. So I, I feel sympathy for uh, mobile app developers who would love to see their application be de delivered and installed for free but they have to monetize that business model somehow. So it's only natural for a flashlight application to all of a sudden start, start asking access to your location data, access to your calendar data, access to your contact list. And what is it doing with that information that would be relevant for uh, lighting up a LED light. Nothing. It's uploading that information to, to the cloud for a customer profiling. All right. I, I know for a fact that there are cases where you actually have to collect lots of information. You, in some businesses you have to know who your customer is. Uh, we, when we are selling something, we probably would love to see that the payments get attributed to actual customer identif identification so that we know who has the license or doesn't have. So I would argue that you should get familiar with the terms anonymization and pseudonymization and you should get acquainted with the differences be between those concepts. How many of you actually do know the difference? Um, I'm guessing this is not the Finnish audience, because a Finnish audience would probably know, but they are too shy to tell about it. But uh, you being a, 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 in Stockholm, you probably 
are would indicate if you would know. So I, I, I want to briefly uh, explain. And this is important to know. When you are pseudonymizing information, you actually have a backdoor to that data. You make it unrecognizable in a fashion that you can actually revert it back to its uh, original state or you can revert it back to at least in a fashion that you can identify users or uh, machine identifiers, IP addresses. So when you're pseudonymizing information, you have a recipe of getting that information back in its full state. So if you are storing pseudonymized information separately from the recipe and the key, if you will, and the pseudonymized information gets stolen, the chances are that it's somewhat useless to the attacker, which is a good thing. So you want to design your systems that there's a separation between what is a, let's say, it could be hashed, hashed information and uh, there's a key to uh, incorporate in, in the hash. So you want to store that key separately which saves you quite a lot about, about the trouble and uh, you would be pretty much compliant with the data protection regulation in, in many senses already. With the anonymization, you would be way more compliant, but you would actually lose information. When you anonymize a data set, you actually mangle in it, it in a fashion that you're not able to revert it back to the original. And in some cases, when you want to have open data, to release open data to your customers or the general public, or if you want to, an API that somebody could uh, make queries against your databases, you might want to anonymize that in a fashion that doesn't reveal your trade secrets and customer data. And that sends you, uh, the the other end of the API could again use that for statistical purposes without a possibility of revealing too much personal information. But uh, that process has to be provably irreversible. And um, that is actually a really difficult thing to do. I give you an example. There's a populations registry in Finland has a service where you can actually query popular names, first names and last names, and how popular they have been in different times. And my name, Erka, that's pretty unusual. There's a limit in the system that if there are less than five encounters of that name, it refuses to give out any information. It's, it just states that, yeah, we know about Erka or several Erkas, but there are too few to mention. All right, I know that I exist, so at least one person exists in Finland with that name. When they originally released that system in the 90s, they didn't pay attention to that feature. And as a student of technology, I was immediately Googling and, uh, well, searching for my name when that service was released. And I know for a fact that in the 90s, there are two different Erkas as well. So there, there are three people in Finland with the name Erka, and at least one of them is a, is a girl. So that, that's already way too much information, and they found out that later. And you, you have to be aware of these kinds of tricks that the attackers and hackers out there are going to use to test your uh, an uh, anonymized or pseudonymized data sets that you're going to release or leave for the attackers to grab. So this is really boring looking document, but you might want to take a look at it because it outlines recommended, uh, recommended technologies on how you might want to achieve the anonymization and pseudonymization targets. It goes into encryption technologies as well, so it's a, if you are into technology, knock yourself out. All right, let's ask a couple of questions.
since you were so good at it. So who actually has been dealing with data breaches or computer security breaches or personal data breaches? Now we have a bit more honest audience. So I would imagine that this is something that you should now understand that you don't get practice. The breaches that you handle with real data, complex systems, when, you, when there's media around, when there are money, there's money involved, and there's authorities, you actually would need to get that process right. And I, I have to tell that I learned that process from an experience, and I know for a fact that most organizations and most people learn it the hard way. And the first time they are doing it, the couple of first times they are doing it, they fail miserably. And the organizations that get hit quite a lot, frequently, and those organizations that are handling other people's computer assets, eventually get quite good at handling incidents. They know how to find the root cause. They know how to limit and contain the problems. They know how to actually secure the systems better next time. And they have gotten uh, enough uh, experience on how to notify uh, the victims, for instance. Uh, most, as I mentioned, most organizations will not be detecting those breaches themselves. So one obvious point for you to start figuring out how to respond to a breach would be to set up a point of contact that external parties then can then notify you. If you are not declaring which assets you are actually responsible and how to contact you in the event of a breach, people who might have information that is relevant for you about the breach will not bother to contact you. The search and search SE for instance, they are trying to tackle that problem on a day-to-day -day basis. They might get a report from Brazil explaining that some Swedish website has been compromised again. And they don't bother to find out which Swedish website that was, so they just pass it to CERT SE and they make an attempt to figure out who it was. Typically, the reporter in Brazil would identify a Swedish website with the .se ending. And I know for a fact that quite many of you are using, for some reason, .nu. Guess which country these reports would go into, not Swedish cert. You might want to let, is it Nauru? That and you, yeah, you, want, you might want to let the cert of Nauru to, to know that your assets and your security team can be reached from this and this and this address once these reports are landing in the Nauru Islands. All right. I guess this question is now in vain. You have? Yes. Was it a pleasant experience? <laughs> yes, we only did it in Sweden because we did it in Norway and Denmark and England. So we just <coughs> sent in and uh, reported the security breach in Sweden. All right. We, we weren't obliged to do it, but we did it just because we did it in the other countries where we were obliged to report. All right, so there, there was an obligation triggered somewhere yeah. and you felt that it would be easiest to follow that same procedure in it? Yeah, in just in case uh, they, the inspections wouldn't talk to each other and then we hadn't reported for Sweden when we hadn't yeah. reported for three other countries. So. And uh, 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 there, are, there are many ways and many places to report and I'm not trying to uh, uh, fool you to and lure you to tell details but 
the breaches that you encounter, the first thing is to actually notify to yourself. Not that many organizations have a ticketing system or a scoreboard or internal reporting mechanisms that they could all keep tally on the security breaches that they have encountered. And if you don't collect that type of information, you are in a difficult position to identify gaps in your security posture. So there is not enough ammunition and food for any de capability development processes. That is something that you should pay attention to. And I know that m many information security managers are struggling to find a justification to set up an, even an internal reporting re uh, mechanism. Now you have an external threat, if you will, that you have to start reporting these incidents to authorities, to external parties. You would want to get your own house in order first. You had a comment or a question? Uh, I mean, the general question was who you actually are referring to here in the question. Have you reported security breach to who? Yeah, and there are, there are many types. You could report to your boss, like in line. You have to es escalate those cases. If you are a subsidi subsidiary of a multinational company, would you actually need to report that back to the headquarters or would it be the local matter? Would you need to report to the customers? Would you actually need to delegate some uh, incident response to your subcontractors, which would be a notification as well? Is there a regulator or a set of regulators that you would need to notify? For instance, uh, and I refer to my, to my experiences in Finland, banks, Insurance companies, they have to report to the Financial Supervisory Authority. Telecommunications providers have to report to the uh, Communications Regulatory Authority. If you are handling any medical data, there's a supervisory body for that. And if you are handling, for instance, selling food or preparing and producing food, you would need to report to these uh, uh, inspection authorities over there. Just to get this right, sorry, because I mean, I, I'm looking at this sort of from, from a public relations perspective, where I've done this many times, but the, the recommendation is either you talk about this because you don't want anyone to find out from anyone else than you. Which okay. is, so, so it, or yeah. We try to contain this information because we don't want anyone to know. That, that's the two perspectives, pretty much. But from what I get, it, this whole new thing is that this will be reported, this will have to be reported. <coughs> With some expectation, it has to be it, it, severe it, enough yeah. that you have to report. But can you tell if you don't have internal reporting system? You would need to actually have your lawyer team evaluate which cases would need to be reported up to the authorities. Yeah. And you don't want to be in a position where your customers or the authorities will find out and start as asking questions. I was in that position when I was a uh, governmental authority and I absolutely loved those moments when I pick up a phone and ask the uh, information security manager that is there something that you would love to tell me but just haven't had the time yet and typically they start sending quite a lot of material and apologizing and uh, depending how, how much of a excuse my French, how much of a dick this authority is going to be in Sweden, you might want to, you, you might expect calls of that nature coming your way also. And depending on type of a breach, it could be that it is next to impossible to hide it. So if your customer database has been doxed, do you know what the doxing is? It, it's been stolen from your systems and it's been sent out for everybody in the world to see. It's documented, so doxed out. So if your customer database is in the paste bin or some other public service for everybody to take a look at, laugh at, 
your customers are going to know about it, the media is going to know about it, and they start asking, asking questions, and you would look really foolish if you don't address that. Uh, if you're reporting to the uh, incident response authorities or to your sectoral uh, supervisory authorities, you probably would also need to report to law, to law enforcement if you, if you want the case to be uh, investigated as a criminal matter. And these different reports would require different types of information. So there's clearly a need for a process, set of instructions, and somebody actually responsible of overseeing that. Everything gets recorded, you have uh, uh, log files and details about telling what was notif uh, what was reported and to whom and at which stage because otherwise you would you would lose the control of that process I, I would imagine that you don't feel too ready about uh, mandatory reporting but I guess we, now I would like to tell why it's such a good thing and why it actually benefits you to go through that trouble. In Black Hat in 2014, I was listening to a keynote performance by a gentleman called Dan Gear. He's working for a company called InQtel, which is a CIA-owned company in somewhere in Manhattan, if I recall right. They are a think tank, if you will. Uh, intelligence agency funds it, but they produce quite a lot public information and the, this gentleman in particular is a renowned thinker and a respected authority in everything cyber. And he had a pretty good keynote where he suggested that societies would need to adopt 10 different policies, if you will, in the future. And uh, at that point of time, even though, even though the general data protection regulation was being drafted at the time already, was it like it took four years to complete? I still thought that this mandatory reporting requirement is a uh, science fiction. It would never take place. And what do we have now? The regulation is now, uh, you, you can now read it. It's, it's the final ratification is not ready, but you only have two years to actually prepare once it gets signed. MSB here in Sweden just announced in April that government organizations have to start reporting incidents. Previously, each different branch of the government, they were reporting incidents up in their chain of command. If they were reporting. Not that many government branches actually had any oversight and any, any enforcement of that reporting requirement. Now MSB as a central authority is sitting on top of those reports and they can compare how different branches are faring and they can start asking questions of their nature like do you have anything to report to me? And they are going to be really hated in the government. And yet at the same, same time, they are providing you as a, as a citizen a great favor. That's your tax money working for you. That's holding government accountable. He was also referring to the fresh right to be forgotten discussion. And I th thought that that would never see the light of the day. But here we are. In 2011, if you recall, Tieto had a major incident in their uh, data warehouse, if you will, and much of the systems that they were in charge of went down for an extended period of time. Now, we could argue that that probably was not a data breach, and data, a personal data breach. So Quite possibly, this is not something that they would need to report according to the 
the General Data Protection Regulation. However, that discussion and the excellent MSB paper that they pushed out subsequently outlined that an IT service provider that is responsible of providing critical services for the society cannot keep it to themselves when they encounter problems. They have to report to the customers and to the chain of the value chain up and down about the problems that they are experiencing. Because it's other people's business that they are fueling with the data and with the network cap capacity and computing power. And at that time there was a dispute. Tieto was a bit reluctant on revealing any details and yeah, government was feeling otherwise. There's simultaneously with this data protection regulation, there's a network and information security directive being written, which would further uh, uh, extend the mandatory reporting requirements and that would not be limited to the personal da data breaches but it would also be relevant for incidents that would cause for, for instance downtime, downtime or vulnerabilities that would not yet uh, lead to breaches. So there, there are the government is getting more and more nosy about what you want to hide and what difficulties you are tackling with, with your systems each and every day. And they want to be in a position to evaluate how you are faring. All right, so the, the government reporting requirement has been outlined in this press release by MSB. And if you click... Um, well, actually, it was over here. I left it out. There's more information about uh, the reporting requirement. It leads you back to CERT SE webpage. And this has been there for years. And I know that some, some, of, uh, some uh, private sector companies in Sweden have been voluntarily reporting to uh, CERT SE for years already. Not because they are obliged to, but because they expect the authorities to actually provide some added value. They expect that once they, the, the company states that what kind of a mess they are into, the government agency can help them to mitigate and recover from that incident. I, I sincerely hope that uh, the data protection regulation notification scheme is going to be of assistance to the, the reporters in a similar fashion. Everybody is a bit afraid that it's going to be an ivory tower, a black hole that you just report the incidents and they are going to then fix a fine for you and tell how much and in which time frame you have to pay. That's not, that's not encouraging that would actually want you to, to limit the, the data and the, the number of incidents that you want to re report. And you are not reporting anything of significance because you don't expect the authorities to, to give anything valuable in return. So now it would be for you and your customers a good time to start engaging with your government to, to discuss what is it in terms of services and added value that they can provide to you in return to these reports. Nobody wants to have a government that just sits on top of your reports and issues a fine. Actually, oh, I'm going to draw you a picture. As I referred to the internal reporting I typically want to highlight the notification schemes or mandatory reporting schemes with these types of uh, pyramids. Let's have this divided in four like this. There would be a threshold for incidents that you would need to report. 
the general data protection regulation is going to put bar over here. The NIS directive might have some other requirement and depending on the sector that, that you're actually operating, the sectoral uh, oversight uh, might have their own. So you would actually need to build several pyramids. So that would be like a, what the pharaohs used to do. They were not content with one pyramid. Each and every pharaoh wanted to have their own. So different government branches and supervisory authorities want their own pyramids. But the cases that would be falling below the threshold would require internal reporting. And definitely you would want to know about these incidents that you can handle internally without having to expose your dirty little secrets to anybody else. And you would actually need to have a criteria to, to satisfy yourself that this actually is an internal incident. And this is something that you have to involve your lawyers, because once you go over the threshold, you are going to report those incidents to the, the authorities. There is going to be a point of contact for privacy, point of contact for information security, point of contact for, let's say, financial, uh, environmental, uh, energy, etc. And they want to know certain things about the incident and they want to know how did you detect it? What have you done so far? What are you planning to do next? Was it some inherent weakness in your systems, processes, or your subcontracting chain that made it possible? Are you going to change that in the future? What is the impact of your, the, the breach to your business and the impact to your customers? What can they do to mitigate that problem? They're going to ask quite a lot of questions depending on how complete the reporting will be. And of course, there's, there's going to be some pain in this near the threshold. You determine an incident that's minor, not worthy of reporting, and somebody finds out a bit about it. And the authority or the media, or the customers start calling, and you're in, a, in an awkward position. It really helps when you can easily find from your filing system that yes, <coughs> this is an issue that we know of, this is what we have been doing for it, and we have determined it to be of this nature, so no reporting requirement triggered. And that would be, well, bad press anyhow, but it's something that you would be on a legal footing anyhow. All right, there's another threshold where the authorities might uh, determine that you actually have to report to the customer. So I would argue that the, the, the threshold for reporting to the authorities will be lower. The threshold for reporting to actual customers would be somewhat higher. And together with the authorities, you might actually need to discuss about that. Discutera. And I know that the Swedes are good at discutering. All right. And then there's a subset of these above the threshold cases that you would actually need to go public. You would need to issue a press statement or the customers are going to rat on you. They are going to leak that to Reddit or whatever forum that is popular. And the, they are going to tell it to the favorite reporters. The authorities might decide that they want to go public with this information on your behalf. And anybody who has been in any dealings with the media, you know that you want to actually take the initiative. You want to be the proactive one. You want to be the, fir the, the person telling the story first, your side of things first, 
before going into the limelight, looking awkward, answering questions. And for each of these parts of the pyramid, you would need to have evaluation criteria when a case is above or uh, below the threshold and whom would you need to actually report these cases in a, in a different phases of an incident. Internal reporting, perhaps your data protection office, uh, officer or chief information security officer, your CEO might need to know at some point of time. Your PR might need to know in case somebody starts asking questions. These cases, because they involve certain legal frameworks, you would need to incorporate your legal department so that you are not, how should I say it politely, you are not telling the authorities too much. You don't want to put your in, yourself in a position where you actually would need to defend against actions that they're going to take. I used to be working for Cert FI and I always kind of had an image of ourselves that we're the friendly authority. We didn't have any power to issue fines and uh, typically the, the voluntary reporters that were approaching us, we had no authority over them. So we could show them a finger Typically, it was this finger, mind you. But we would not be in a position to force them to do anything. And we were basically thanking for the reports and trying our best to help them recover from the incident. The mandatory scheme is a bit different. When the authority has authority over you, they might even exercise that. And the, the fines and the other consequences that the authority might issue upon you might severely impact your ability to do your business. And yeah, customers, shareholders, media, they, they want scandalous cases. They, they, they are not going to be polite to you. They, they want to frame an incident in a fashion that you are the only person and only company in the world that actually sucks in this and everybody else is so much better, I'm going to take my money there. <coughs> Which we all know is not the case, but you want to portray that, you take things seriously. Alright, so what to include in these reports? Basically, The only difference between the, what you would need to report to the, the customers, so that they are the data subjects, and to what the, the material that you would need to report to the authorities is that, that the authorities want to know the total tally of the impact and the individual customer should only mind his or her own business. However, it might be a bit difficult for you to, if you have 10 million customers and all of them have been exposed, so you contact them individually without telling who else or how many other customers have been affected, there are going to be public discourse from, from from that on, so you want to actually state that in public. Uh, the likely adver adverse consequences for the data subject is something that you might actually need to speculate a bit, but that's something that the, the authorities are encouraging you to do. You would need to spell in, in plain text to the data subject that what this information, now that it has been deleted or exposed, what can it be used to in a fashion that would cause some adverse consequences to the, the customer. So for instance, you would need to speculate that this could be used in a fraud. You might want to 
prepare for the fact that your credit card information is going to be used against your something else. Right, cases of public notifications. <coughs> Apologies, this is probably too small text. There's a company in the US called Anthem that got breached. Their user database got hacked and leaked out. There's a bit mixed information about whether the, the information was pseudonymized in a, in a good fashion or whether it was <coughs> in fact reversible. Uh, I don't know the specifics about that. It's not that important. The, whenever we have been now trying to educate European audiences about likelihood of not only getting breached, but likelihood of you having to publicly state about this or to report to the authorities, we have always been, uh, the customers have been always complaining that the, all the examples are from the US. They are not relevant to the Scandinavian uh, realities. Why always American companies? And this Wall Street Journal article pretty eloquently states it that federal law in the states requires in certain certain sectors that these breaches have to be notified. End of discussion. They have had mandatory reporting requirements for long times already. Each and every state in the US has enforced some sort of mandatory reporting requirement and there's one, uh, actually several of those on a federal level. So no wonder there's lots of ammunition for typically American press to cover these things. And it's always American companies, not because they are doing such a lousy job in defending their systems, but because they have to disclose this. Publicly listed companies are required to report cases if it affects their stock ev evaluations. And Americans are enforcing that quite rigorously. So, with the European legislation being adopted, we can now see that some of you might be in the a, in a headlines. And we can all be smiling that finally we have European examples of data breaches being discussed in public. Uh, the, this uh, healthcare regulation in the US states that you have to report in, uh, within 60 days, which is pretty slow. The, European regulation states that over the week, weekend, three days, right? Uh, Anthem decided to go public way earlier and that they were applauded for that. They detected the breach themselves, which might explain why they wanted to go, go public on their own terms. They wanted to actually highlight the fact that they had such a sophisticated system to detect those breaches. And they had to report to all the affected customers. And this is so American. They are providing free credit monitoring for the affected. This is, if you are listening to an excellent information security podcast called Risky Business, they typically just liken the free credit card monitoring to dozens of Ave Marias that you would need to do when you're committing in a sin. Ten Ave Marias and you're good to go. Free credit monitoring for a year and you're off the hook. And this is because the legislation in the US states that <coughs> you would need to actually mitigate the, uh, uh, the consequences to the data subjects and one sanctioned means of mitigating is to offer credit monitoring. Let's see what is going to be the Ave Maria for the European companies. We don't know yet. This is the web page that they set up. Uh, a bit unrelated notification requirement. I'm not sure if you have re recognized, but um, 
Oracle has now acknowledged that the support for the, their Java plugin is, is uh, not popular among popular web browsers, so, so they decided that they are going to discontinue that product. This is their end of life notification. That's not the whole truth. Oracle actually got fined by the Federal Trade Commission because they were lying to the general public about the security aspects of Java runtime. FTC asserted that Oracle was lying when they were telling that Java was secure and that the updates that you would receive would fix the problems. And FTC made a ruling that Oracle has to actually go out and apologize and offer an easy to use mechanism for you to get rid of Java, which is death sentence to your business. And the authorities and in extreme situations might make you to do this. This is the FTC ruling, if you are interested in that. They are also going after mobile phone manufacturers, uh, small office and home router manufacturers. ASUS, for instance, they have to report, uh, they have to conduct security audits for the next 20 years and release those audit reports to FTC if ASUS is still existing for the next 20 years. I'm going to skip the next slide. Uh, brief discussion about the detection problem. Uh, and I'm going to skip a couple of slides here because I'm running out of time. Uh, some years ago, I, I wrote a study paper on the so-called victim notification problem. That's why I up front I stated that most of the victims of those information security breaches have no clue about those incidents. And these are incidents where the people are actually operating their own computers. There would be laptops, PCs, websites that uh, companies and individuals would be operating that would be compromised and the owners of those systems would have no clue. So imagine that if your own asset that you are responsible of operating, setting up and securing can be compromised for weeks, months, years in a row and you don't have a clue, what chances you as a data subject would have if the data that you are releasing to a service provider that is handling the data on your behalf without you knowing how it's being handled. What chances do you have to actually realize when it's being breached? You don't and you, that's why the regulation states that it has to be reported back to you when it's being detected. So the victim notification process is, a, I forced it to be a linear, it could be uh, uh, drawn otherwise, but I wanted to highlight the fact that it's actually pretty difficult to detect incidents. It is, it sounds really stupid, but good attacks that exploit vulnerabilities, security weaknesses, configuration weaknesses, are such that they either leave no good traces in the logs, or if they do, you are not in a position to identify those. And that's, that's the state of affairs that we do have currently. Uh, when you finally identify a bridge, it could be that you identify a bridge belonging to somebody else. I mentioned the Brazilians contacting Nauru Islands. You don't know whose systems in the internet they are. Similarly, if you get 15 million records of somebody's user database, you don't want to spend time contacting 15 million users. You might want to at least spend five minutes trying to identify whose database it was. And if it's really difficult to find, out, find that out, 
people typically don't bother. And when you are sending out those reports, the recipients, i.e. you, would need to be in a position to, to evaluate that this is not a hoax and this is a, a genuine report that you can actually back up with your own evidence. And only after that you can take corrective action. So, and, and it, actually this is an advertisement in a, in a fashion. Next week we're going to release a, a managed security service specifically designed to detect advanced targeted attacks to your networks. The attacks of a kind that typically do not involve any malware. These are attacks that aim to persist in your networks and aim to utilize your own user credentials and your own sysadmin tools in a fashion that is against your own interests. And the, the idea is that we have a pretty wide array of adversaries that are involved in these kinds of activities and they are not only after data but they are also after control of your systems. They get foothold in different parts of your systems. And while they are doing their thing, it is inevitable that they are going to leave small footprints here and there. And typically our systems currently, if they log anything at all, they are not in a position to identify that these footprints actually indicate that something has gone wrong and something is about to go wrong really fast in the future. And the service that we're going to launch is, is such that for the enterprise level customers, we make a promise that we are going to report incidents within 30 minutes to the security managers of those companies so that they can initiate adequate responses. And without them having to go through the years of building capabilities in terms of log collection, log correlation, incident response uh, capability and service uh, security operations center. Within one week you're set to go and we're handling the rest. And if there are questions that you would love to have, I'm now ready to take those. And I have to remind, I'm not a lawyer, so no Legal questions, please. Have you seen any indications of uh, the date, uh, the reported data which goes to the government? Are those going to be public also? Like in uh, US, I have seen we're looking at PCI data, and there's lots of public data on the how they did it and how what was breached and how much. Is that also going to be? Open? Yeah. And that's, a, that's an excellent question. So, uh, and yeah, when you are under obligation to report to the authorities, you actually want to be mindful of the, the life cycle of that notification. What is it going to be used for? Is it going to be made public in part or in full? And is it going to come back and haunt you in five years? For instance, Target, the American company again, they made lots of mistakes which enabled hackers to steal all the customer credit card information for months in their systems. And they subjected themselves to lots of litigation and much of the court cases are still pending. The, the CEO lost uh, his job as a consequence, but they have now made a serious effort in rebuilding their security posture. And currently I would imagine Target is pretty well uh, prepared to face similar types of attacks. They have detection capabilities for advanced attacks. So Target's, Target's name is still being tarnished with the old sins and you don't want the government officials to be part of that, you know, that uh, smearing of your reputation. So, uh, whatever information you are revealing 
at least make an effort to indicate which parts of the document and which parts of the information are going to be trade secrets or something that you consider to be not public. And I would love to form uh, a dialogue with the authorities to discuss what <coughs> types of information they plan to make public. And I, I know that there's a school of thought that I entertain as, as well that when you learn about diverse set of incidents, you want to actually share that information back to the community so that you would actually be better prepared with facts to know what kinds of incidents are taking place, what weaknesses uh, are um, enabling those, what success factors you might have to counter those attacks, what trends are we experiencing over time. So the authorities should be actually expected to release some of that information. There's a lot of uh, exchange of technical indicators of compromise among CERT authorities taking place every day of the year. This information is describing the technical mechanisms of how the attack was conducted and how to detect those attacks if you see them somewhere else. And this is always uh, constructed in a fashion that removes in indicators that uh, inform contextual information that would identify the organizations, even the countries and especially the individuals involved. So you want to, the, you want to, to actually, the authorities to give something back to you in terms of these indicators of compromise, but you want to denote which parts of the information you definitely do not want to go out and which parts of the information you don't want to go out in a fashion that is attributable back to you. All right, the, the authorities in Finland, they have a, a classification scheme, which is a bit different from Sweden, if I understood correctly. Everything is public or hemlik. And I guess if you're making things secret, they are pretty secret and you cannot do anything about it. Otherwise it's public and there's nothing in between. So you might be might need to educate the authorities which parts of the information you would need to leave out. You are have to planning to kick me out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, big thanks, Claude, for our time. It was a pleasure.